The Sainsbury Wing's first galleries present Italian paintings from the 13th and 14th centuries when the roots of a new painting style took hold. Comparison of two small paintings, one attributed to the Clarisse master, Virgin and Child, of about 1265 to 1275, and the other by Cianni di Peppo, known as Cimabue, Virgin and Child enthroned with two angels, from about 1265 to 1280, shows us what late medieval painting looked like in Italy and how it began to change in the late 13th century. The Clarisse master, active in the last third of the 13th century, is a painter whose name is unknown to us. The term Clarisse master refers to the fact that his most prominent work was made for a female religious order, the Poor Clares, in Siena. We say that it is attributed to him to indicate that there is neither signature nor documentary evidence to prove conclusively that the Clarisse master painted this work, but that the style is consistent with other works attributed to him. The majority of paintings from the 13th and 14th centuries that are now in museums are attributions, since the authorship of few paintings was documented in that era. Paintings were not signed and they were not dated. His career, the Clarisse Masters, was centered in Siena, one of the most prominent towns in the region of central Italy called Tuscany. Siena became a free republic in the late medieval period and was a well-to-do community because of banking business and the international wool trade. The style of this painting is often called Italo-Byzantine. The Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, with its capital in Constantinople, today's Istanbul, had a long-established artistic tradition derived from late Roman art. In 1204, crusaders from Western Europe, ostensibly called to help protect the Eastern Empire from Muslim conquest, actually sacked the city and carried off many treasures, including religious images painted on wooden panels used for devotions. These were called icons in the Eastern tradition. Many painters active in Constantinople left the city afterward and practiced their trade in Europe, especially in Italy. There they transmitted the Byzantine style in which figures shown as flat, almost abstracted forms with lines of gold standing for highlights float against gold backgrounds, creating timeless images that are more conceptual than naturalistic in effect. The Virgin and Child by the Clarisse Master shows these elements, but also includes another Byzantine convention, the tender relationship of the Christ child and his mother Mary. The child, however, is not shown as a real infant, but as a miniature adult, which is also characteristic of Byzantine art. The subject of the Virgin and Child, often referred to as the Madonna and Child in Italian art, was one of the most popular religious subjects in late medieval and Renaissance art throughout Europe. The role of the Virgin Mary as an intercessor for sinful humans with Christ and God the Father played a significant role in European Christian culture until the Protestant Reformation. The Clarisse Master included other moments in the life of Mary and Jesus in this painting. The Annunciation, when the angel Gabriel announced to Mary that, though a virgin, she would bear the Messiah. The crucifixion, when Christ died on the cross. And a future event, the Last Judgment, when angels helped to separate the saved from the damned. None of these scenes takes place in anything like a realistic space. Flat figures float against the gilded, that is, gold leaf, background. The same subject of the Virgin and Child was painted perhaps 20 years later by Cimabue, whose dates were about 1240 to 1302, who was active in Florence. Cimabue, his nickname, means something like ox-headed or stubborn. He is among the very first artists of the Italian tradition whose names we know. He's mentioned in Dante's writings, for instance. The 16th century chronicler of Italian art, Giorgio Vasari, considered Cimabue to be the first painter in a new Italian tradition that culminated in the 16th century re Renaissance. Vasari thought that Cimabue was the teacher of Giotto, the great initiator of naturalism in 14th century Florentine art. A small panel, the Pentecost, largely by Giotto's workshop, hangs in the National Gallery and gives a hint of his style of weighty figures and architectural definition of space. 
Florence, like Siena, was a Tuscan city on the rise in the 14th century because of banking and the wool trade. Owing allegiance to the Pope in Rome, it was otherwise self-governing at this time. The increasing wealth of cities like Florence and Siena helped to stimulate the patronage of art. The art of this time was almost exclusively religious in nature, even when commissioned for what we would consider to be secular places, such as town halls or courts of justice. The subject of Cimabue's painting is actually the virgin and child in majesty, called a Maya sta in Italian. That means that they are shown enthroned with angels to either side. While Cimabue's painting still displays many elements of the Italo-Byzantine style, including the elongated figures and linear emphasis, there are two important differences from the Clarisse master's painting. The throne is shown at an angle, turned in space, and thus the world of three dimensions is suggested. The position and stances of the angels also suggest their disposition in space. Second, the figures, while still thin and relatively weightless, are not as flattened as those in the Clarisse Master's Virgin and Child. Compare the faces of the Virgin in each painting to see how Cimabue departs from the schematic rendering of the human face. In these two still subtle changes, we see the beginnings of a more naturalistic approach to the representation of the human form and the suggestion of space. Cimabue, like the Clarisse master, presents the relationship of mother and child as a tender one. Here, the Christ child holds on to his mother in an even more childlike manner. The size and technique of Cimabue's painting corresponds closely with another small painting of Christ's flagellation, his whipping during the Passion, now in the Frick Collection in New York. This suggests that both paintings were part of a larger work, later taken apart and sold as individual fragments. This was a common fate for many multi-part religious paintings from the medieval and Renaissance eras. And many of these fragments make up a good proportion of various museums' collections of earlier Italian painting, including the National Galleries. Both of these paintings are recent acquisitions by the National Gallery. The Cimabue was purchased in 2000, the Clarisse Masters painting in 1998. The collection of a major museum, uh, the collections of a major museum are never static, but change as opportunities arise to fill in gaps or to provide a richer picture of a time period, region, or individual artist's career. Duccio's Virgin and Child with Saints, painted about a generation later than Cimabue's painting, about 1315, is a superb example of how Sienese art continued to develop out of the Italo-Byzantine style. It is also painting in excellent condition for its age, with much of its original attached frame preserved. Duccio, who was active tw around 1278 and died 1318 or 1319, was the leading master in Siena, whose enormous Maya staff for Siena's cathedral is his best-known work. Several fragments from it are now in the National Gallery in London. Civic records detailing numerous fines, often for political activity, hint at the complexity of this painter's life. We hardly know any names of painters before the late 13th century, much less facts about their lives. The fact that we will increasingly know about painters as individuals suggests a distinct change in Italian society and the artist's status within it. The National Gallery's painting by Duccio shows the Virgin and Child at its center. They are the largest figures in the painting. To either side of them, angels float against the gold background. In the pointed spandrel, or arch top, of the central panel is a group of Old Testament prophets, each shown in half length. From left to right, they are Daniel, Moses, Isaiah, David, Abraham, Jacob, and Jeremiah. David, as an ancestor of Jesus, has the place of honor at the top center. Old Testament inscriptions accompany each figure. To left and right, the virgin and child are flanked by two saints, Dominic at the left and perhaps St. Aurea at the right. The female St. Aurea was rarely shown in art, but she was the patron saint of the town of Ostia. It was thought that this painting was possibly made for the cardinal of Ostia in the early 14th century, Niccolò de Prato, who was a member of the Dominican order. 
such personalization in the choice of saints would make sense if he were the patron. So we have Dominic, if uh, Niccolo de Prato being a Dominican, and Oria, the patron saint of the town where he lives. If this is the case, the painting likely functioned as a personal altarpiece, one not connected to a specific church and altar. An altarpiece is a work of art, painted or sculpted, that hangs above and typically behind a Christian altar where the liturgy of the Mass is performed. It is meant to call attention particularly to the moment in the Mass when the priest, who in the 13th century had his back to the congregation, lifts the communion bread, the host, in consecration, replicating Christ's Last Supper. In order to make clear that the host actually became the body of Christ, altar pieces typically depicted Christ in his bodily human form. In the early 14th century, only a few members of society, such as high-ranking clerics or royalty, might own a personal altarpiece that could be carried with them when they traveled. The scale of Duccio's painting, the central panel measures only 16.7 by 13.6 inches, is not the only clue to its status as a portable altarpiece. This altarpiece is a triptych or three-part painting. The side wings would fold over the central image to protect the paintings. The wings were painted to imitate marble on their reverse for when the altarpiece was closed. Duccio's style is fluid and refined, still derived from Italo-Byzantine predecessors, but the shading of the figure's faces, hands, and drapery, the clothing, helps to convey a sense of the figure beneath. Mary's body is turned in space in order to accommodate her pose in which Jesus is supported by her left arm, while her right hand hovers protectively above his legs. The interaction of mother and child is again emphasized as Jesus lifts his mother's veil. The greenish tint of some of the flesh tones, especially on Mary's face, detracts from a sense of naturalism for us. However, this tone was never intended to be seen so clearly and is an artifact of how paintings change over time. A greenish tone was often painted on faces and hands in an underlayer of paint to provide a unifying cool tone and to help define shadows. This layer is sometimes called the undermodeling. Other layers of paint would be added over the green tone to suggest the slight differences in color seen in lighted conditions, giving a greater sense of volume. However, over time, these upper layers of paint can become thinner and more transparent or are worn away through damage, revealing too much of the green tones beneath. This needs to be kept in mind for many 13th and 14th century Italian paintings. This triptych was painted with tempera paints, where dried pigment uh, is mixed with water and a binding medium, usually egg yolk. Tempera paint, when dried, is relatively durable and can be mixed to make vibrant colors. The beautiful blue robe of the Virgin was painted here with ultramarine, a very expensive pigment derived from the semi-precious stone lapis lazuli. However, tempera paint is opaque and cannot be used to create an impression of translucency, like oil paint, which can incorporate semi-transparent layers of oil with little pigment in them. Nor can one manipulate the thickness of the paint itself for textural effects. Tempera's working consistency is thin and smooth. Paintings from this time period were collaborative efforts. The wooden panels, typically poplar in Italy, were joined together by a specialist. Some elements, such as the curved moldings on Duccio's painting, were actually built up out of plaster. The panels were prepared for painting by spreading animal-based glue on the surface, then attaching a thin piece of canvas, which would help to even out any flaws or joins in the panels. After the glue dried, gesso would be applied. This was made with gypsum mixed with animal-based glue that could be buffed to create a completely smooth surface with any faults in the wooden panel now covered over. The master painter would then sketch out the composition on the white gesso in what is called an underdrawing using charcoal and sometimes ink. A carbon-based underdrawing can be revealed through the use of infrared reflectography an imaging technique that penetrates the layers of paint. Underdrawing has been found in this painting and accords with what we know of Duccio's underdrawings for other paintings, supporting the attribution of this panel to the artist. 
For a painting such as Duccio's, framing also typically took place before painting, and the gold background had to be applied before any paint as well. Through affixing thin sheets of gold leaf to a slightly adhesive reddish-brown clay substance called bowl. Then any patterned textural work on the gilded background would start. Punches, tools that made repeated patterns when struck with a hammer, would be used along with styluses to incise the gold leaf in linear designs. These embossed and incised patterns not only made the surface look richer, their changing surfaces would actually help to reflect more light, increasing the glitter of the gold. Only after all of these decorative markings were in place would painting and colors begin. At the very end of the process, details might be added in gold, as with the border of the Virgin's drapery in Duccio's painting. In a workshop such as Duccio's, there might well be an assortment of artists who tended to specialize in one or another of these various tasks. Actual carpentry work on the panels might even take place in a woodworker's shop rather than in the painter's workshop. Much of what conservators can now discern about late medieval paintings from scientific examination of various kinds is confirmed by an invaluable text, Cennino Cennini's Libro dell'Arte of about 1390. Here the accumulated contemporary wisdom about how to best make paintings was gathered together. It is significant that Cennini recommended that young artists should copy both nature and great masters in their training in order to develop their own styles. The role of both nature and other artists in the development of Renaissance art was already presaged in the era just before it. With Jacopo de Cioni's and his workshop's crucifixion from about 1368 to 70, we change cities, subjects, and to some degree, styles. One event that separated the, wor the world of Duccio from Di Cione's was the Black Death, the bubonic plague of 1348. Its terrible toll on populations all over Europe uh, was certainly felt in Italy. And for a generation or so afterward, fewer artworks were made. Those that were were done in a more conservative style. In the last third of the century, both trade and the business of art revive. Jacopo de Cione, active about 1362, died 1398 to 1400, worked in Siena and was one of three brothers who were all respected painters with active workshops. Jacopo appears to have often worked in collaboration with other painters. Differences in painting style of various figures within the crucifixion indicate that he did so here as well. The subject of Christ's crucifixion was a typical choice for an altarpiece such as Jacopo di Cioni's. Unlike timeless images of the Virgin and Child, the crucifixion is a narrative subject from Christ's passion. Di Cioni treats it as an epic story with many figures. Christ and the two thieves executed alongside him, Christ's followers, including his mother, Mary, Mary Magdalene and St. John the Evangelist, Roman soldiers on foot and on horseback, curious onlookers, and angels who mourn and collect Christ's sacrificial blood. The shield is inscribed SPQR for Senatus Populusque Romanus, the Senate and the people of Rome, to help establish the historical nature of the event portrayed. There is a sense of weight to individual figures, and they interact realistically while they overlap in space. It is still nonetheless set against an abstract timeless gold background, like the earlier paintings we have seen. In addition to the main scene, four male saints are shown at larger scale in separate compartments. At left, John the Baptist and St. Paul, and at right, St. James and St. Bartholomew. Except for John the Baptist, each holds the symbol of his martyrdom. There is a final painted strip at the bottom of the altarpiece called the predella, which means step in Italian. In roundels, round paintings, more saints are depicted there. From left to right, an unidentified female saint, St. Bernard, St. Anthony Abbott, and St. Catherine of Alexandria. The Virgin and Child are given the most prominent position in the center of the predella. 
The Crucifixion is a rare example of an early altarpiece that is still intact, including its original, though in part restored, frame. As with Duccio's Virgin and Child, the frame was attached to the panels before they were painted. The pilasters, the flat column-like strips to each side, were also original. Their raised textural ornamentation was made from gesso. This is called pastiglia in Italian, that kind of decoration. We need to think of frame and painting then as, an in, uh, as one unit conceived as such from the very start. The canopy at the top with its Gothic domes is a framing element more often found on sculpted altarpieces to protect carvings from dust. If you look up inside of the canopy, you will see that each dome is painted with a blue background on which stars appear. This suggests both a nighttime sky, recalling the darkness said to fall on the earth at the time of Jesus' death, and the painted ceilings of late medieval chapels, which were often painted blue with stars on them, representative of heaven. The colors of the crucifixion are rich and varied. Note in particular the juxtaposition of the vermilion, the bright red robe of Mary Magdalene, with the Virgin Mary's ultramarine blue garment. Powdered silver was applied to areas such as the helmets of the Roman soldiers. Unfortunately, silver tends to tarnish and darken over time, thus depriving us of some of the bright glittering effects of this painting when first made. We will end this lecture with a late 14th century painting that is as enigmatic as it is beautiful. The Wilton Diptych has been dated about 1395 to 1399 and must have been made for the private devotions of Richard II, then King of England. It receives its name from the fact that it long resided in Wilton House, residence of the Earls of Pembroke, and is a two-part painting a diptych, as opposed to a three-part painting, a triptych. The foremost mystery about this painting is who made it and where. Well, there was a lively tradition of manuscript painting in England in the 14th century. Few native panel paintings of the era survive. The style of the work suggests awareness of 14th century Sienese painting with the elegant elongated forms and delicate faces the balance of some naturalism, such as the poses of the kneeling angels, with the preservation of a timeless, abstracting style. However, this was also the heyday of the so-called international Gothic style, where some of the traits listed above appeared in works made in France and what is now Belgium, Germany, and the Czech Republic, called Bohemia. International trade and diplomacy were lively in the late 14th century, and artists and artworks traveled a great deal, helping to disseminate the style that developed largely in Italy in the first half of the 14th century. It was a style often associated with courts, inherently sophisticated centers of patronage. The tempera painting technique used here accords with Italian practice, but the white ground was not gesso, that mixture of gypsum and glue, but rather white chalk and glue, a combination found in Northern European art. The panels, are, the panels here are not poplar, but oak, also used in Northern Europe. Thus, various scenarios have been suggested that the painting was made at Richard's court by an Italian, Bohemian, or French artist, or it could have been commissioned abroad, probably in France, therefore, and sent to England. The iconography, meaning the meaning of the symbols, both individually and collectively, of the painting is also complex. On the left panel, Richard II kneels in an outdoor setting accompanied by saints. From left to right, they are King Edmund holding the arrow that killed him in 869, and King Edward, the confessor, died in 1066, holding a ring. These are the attributes that identify these two. Thus, we have three English kings, two of whom were sainted, present in this panel. The third standing saint with them is John the Baptist, holding the Lamb of God, symbol of Jesus Christ. Richard II was born on January 6th, 
which the Christian church marked as celebrating both the baptism of Christ in the River Jordan by John the Baptist and the Feast of the Epiphany, when the Magi, the three kings, arrived in Bethlehem to adore the Christ child. Associated with his predecessors as English kings, Richard II becomes something like the third magus or king. So we have put together a situation that draws on the meaning of that birth date in both senses. This is an idealized portrait depicting the king as a beardless youth when in fact he was in a bearded adult in his 30s at this point. Portraiture was extremely rare still in the 14th century, even for monarchs. And our concept of the portrait as a likeness, an image of one specific person at one specific moment in their life, was not yet established. On the right-hand panel, the Virgin Mary holds the Christ child who reaches out towards Richard in a gesture of blessing. They are placed in a paradise garden, which is witnessed by the naturalistic flowers we see on the ground, but in the timeless realm of heaven, characterized here with the gold background. A group of angels surround them. One angel holds a white banner with a red cross. This is a symbol of Christ's resurrection, but also recalls the banner of St. George, who was the patron saint of England. Atop this banner, there is an orb with a tiny green island depicted on it, representing Richard's island realm, which he has thus dedicated to the virgin and child. Many such details help to identify this painting as Richard II's. Both he and the angels wear decorations featuring a white heart, a grown male deer, that was Richard's personal emblem or symbol. Their collars and Richard's show an unusual organic device, pods of the broom plant. These were actually part of French royal iconography. Richard's second wife, Isabel, whom he married in 1396, was the daughter of the French king, Charles VI. Charles had actually given Richard a collar of broom cods, as the pods of the broom plant are called, at the time of this marriage, which coincided with a peace treaty between the two countries. The style of the painting is incredibly refined and shows a love of ornamentation. The patterning of the gold background is different on the two panels, while the robes of the kings are luxuriously decorated through the use of scraffito. The technique of scraffito entailed painting in color over the gold ground, then scratching through the colored paint with a stylus to reveal the gold beneath. The halo, that golden circle indicating holiness that we see around Jesus' head, is decorated with nails and thorns, prefiguring his torture with the crown of thorns and the nails of crucifixion during his passion. Mary's robe is here again painted with ultramarine. The outside of the diptych is also painted. On the left panel are the arms of Edward the Confessor, linked with lions and lilies, other personal symbols of Richard II. Richard's white heart is featured on the right-hand panel, resting on grass and rosemary. The green pigment has darkened over time here. The heart's antlers are incised in the gold. The Wilton diptych is in fine condition overall. Often, such precious paintings were stored closed in a series of containers that protected them from damage. In this case, we can thus come as close as possible to understanding the quality of production and delicacy of ornamental techniques used for painting for the most important patrons of 600 years ago. Sadly for Richard, he did not have long to enjoy this painting. He was deposed in 1399 and killed in 1400. Before we leave the 14th century, let us just consider again the function of these paintings. Whether meant for public or private display, all of the paintings we have seen in this lecture are religious images, making clear how much Christianity dominated European culture at this time. When we see them in a museum, it is easy to forget this function, as well as the fact that we are seeing them outside of their original sites and contexts. Secondly, the fact that three of these paintings have their original frames is really extraordinary, given that paintings have so often been dismembered. Ironically, though, original frames are perhaps more likely to exist for 14th century paintings than for those a century or two later, 
when frame and the painting surface were no longer considered and built as one inseparable unit. We will start to see this shift already in the next lecture where even greater stylistic changes will be introduced.